been a great revival. Let me just set the setting a little bit. There had been a revival that broke out in Samaria. And uh, while they were there, while Philip was there, uh, there was great things happening. It was accompanied by miracles and the power of God was there. Philip had two daughters and both of them were prophets. And the Lord really was using Philip. The sick were being healed. Demons were cast out. And the glory of God was manifested throughout the whole city and, and, and there was a great moving going on and it stirred, uh, uh, it was stirred by the preaching of this young guy, Philip. And the Bible says that uh, people said of him that he had come into their cities and was turning their cities upside down. That means that demonic forces were no longer able to be entrenched and, and, and you know, fixed in their own uh, 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 controls, but their controls were being shook. As I said at watch night service, everything that can be shaken is being shook. So you need to get that picture now. There's a great prayer meeting going on, a revival going on, and the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, telling him to arise and to go uh, towards the south was a road that went past Jerusalem and went along the Mediterranean uh, Sea and it went all the way to the northern part of Africa. And behold, a man, an Ethiopian, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem for worship. Now, there's no doubt that this woman, uh, Candace, that the queen was extremely wealthy. And the northern part of Africa at that time was flourishing, and this woman was extremely wealthy, and here was the treasurer. Now, that's, that's a high position, a man with a lot of authority and a man with a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, influence. The Bible says that he had great authority. How many of you see that? Now, verse 28, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was riding along in the Cadillac of the day and he was reading Isaiah the prophet, chapter 53. And then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot. So he's riding along and he's reading Isaiah 53 and he's just kind of cruising there. And, and Philip has to run and catch up with him. So Philip ran, verse 30, to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said back to him, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come on, come up and sit with him. So all of a sudden uh, the chariot, the Cadillac of the day slows down and Philip gets up there and he gets on the Cadillac and he's on the chariot there. And now he begins to, uh, you know, just go along the road uh, and, and, and he began to share, he began to explain uh, the salvation story about Jesus out of Isaiah and that he was the Messiah. And verse 32, the place in the scripture which read was this, he was led as sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shears to silent, so he opened up not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And now as they went down the road, they came to some water. So they must have come along beside the Mediterranean in a way that they could access or reach the water there. And so it says, and they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? What does that mean? That means Philip not only told him about salvation, he told him how to get baptized. He told him how to get the Holy Ghost. He gave him the whole package. And then Philip said, if you believe uh, with your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Wow. 
Now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. I guarantee he did. I mean, one minute you're riding along and you've got all the money in the world of that time and, 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 and you're reading out of this, this scroll, the, the prophet Isaiah, and you find out that there is a Messiah. Can you imagine what this eunuch, who doesn't have a name, can you imagine what it was like for him to come up out of the tank? I mean, speaking in tongues, comes up gloriously baptized only to watch Philip go. Whew. I bet he was rejoicing. How many of you hear that? Now history tells us, saints, that around this period of time, from that moment forward, great revival broke out in Ethiopia. And the Ethiopian church became a very powerful and really is today in so many ways. There's a great move of God happening in the Ethiopian world through the Ethiopians in their churches. There's a move of God. And it is reflectively uh, looked back to as the fact that during this period of time, uh, uh, when Philip touched that eunuch, he went back and so influenced everybody around him that God began to take over that nation. Great things began to happen. Now, here's the, the beauty of this. The man went away rejoicing, verse 40. But Philip was later found at Azostus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, geographically, saints, that was a huge distance, okay? That was a massive distance that he got translated from one area to the next. He ended up owning a home in Caesarea. He ended up, that's where uh, Philip's life was. Philip became a great instrument in Caesarea and around surrounding areas to continue the move of God and the, and, and, and the revival of God. To, and this was a highlight moment in Philip's life. Are you listening? Now, God was moving through Philip in such a powerful way in this. Uh, and then when the angel speaks to him, and Philip goes there to this place. I want you to go back to verse one because I want you to see what it was. He said, I want you to get up and go to a desert. How do you see that? Now, I believe that through theologians and preachers, we have put some wrong emphasis on the subject of the desert, which I'm gonna try today to twist it a little, turn it a little, so that you can see almost like looking at a diamond and if you get it turned into just right light, you can really see the sparkle of the diamond. So allow the word today to allow it to be turned enough where you could see something that's of truth. Are you listening? Because when people refer to the desert, they oftentimes have used it as a place where God, uh, deals with somebody and, 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 and where God just, you know, got tired of you and he just stuck you out there so he could beat you up. Come on. And you hear people say, the Lord just put me in the desert. I'm in a desert place, dry and all of that. Well, saints, not all the desert was dry. There were oases in the desert. There were streams in the desert, the Bible says. Moses had a rock running around in the desert that had water in it. So, you know, we need to make sure we get the right understanding of the reference to the desert because I'm going to show you in a minute how the desert has played a significant role in some of the greatest men of God in our Bible and God wants to use it in your life. Every man and every woman that God ever has ever laid his hand upon or called has gone into a desert place. I'm going to show you. It's a pretty amazing thing. Now, I'm talking not only from a desert place. I don't necessarily mean 
and I'll show you in Joseph's life that it has to be sand and etc. but a desert place could also be called a solitary place. Have you hear that? A solitary place in your place where your spiritual walk, uh, where God separates you, uh, where God can speak to you, where God is going to meet you face to face, where your own prayers are the most important prayers that you're gonna have. How many of you know until God gets you to live off of your own prayers, you'll always live off of everybody else's prayers? And sometimes God won't let you live off of the prayers of your mother or your father or somebody. He'll force you into situations that you got to develop your own prayer life so that you stand on the solid concrete of your prayers. And we don't like quietness. See, that's why jail is so hard on people because jail is a place oftentimes where in your cell at least it's quiet. Hello. And many of us today don't like quiet. We don't like to get in a solitary place where we only hear our own breath. Are you listening? But God likes to bring us to that place because it's in the solitary place that God can speak to you and you can hear the voice of God. Are you listening to me? Oh, how powerful that is. It's a place of silence and a place of solitude, a place of you and God. You see, we live in a, a day and an age where Facebook and tweets and blogs and all that other junk have become occupiers for us. They are pacifiers. Our television, our laptops, our cell phones, they're, 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 they're all pacifiers because they, they, they're talking to us and it keeps us from feeling like we're alone or that we're quiet. God forbid we get so quiet that we might hear God. Sometimes we think that, that, that it's the hand of man that's moving things. You're going to give God no credit, saints. God's a whole lot bigger than man. You better get a hold of that. God just removes a man that's in his way. It ain't God that sets in. It's God that, I mean, it ain't man that sets in. It's God that sets in. He raises up one and sets down another. It's God that does the appointment. It's God that does this. The minute you demise it or diminish it down to being just men, you've lost contact with who God is. Hello? Just like all this presidential jockeying that's going on. Just like this thing with this Iranian president. You know, he's about the size of a fly. And if the Lord chooses, he's gone. It's like the other day, the Argentine leader Boom, gone. God is the one that holds these things in his hands. Are you listening to me? Every prophet has his desert experience. You have never met anybody that can ever come and minister the word of life, the word of deliverance, and the word of power that God didn't first meet in the desert. Oh, if you want to know what maturity is, saints, you know, there's people that run around and they, they want to give all kinds of advice to people. They want to tell people what they feel God wants them to do. And, and you know, saints, you, you got to be around a little while to find out if that person has, has got a little sand in their shoes. Hello? If they ain't got no sand in their shoes, you need to just kind of laugh and say, well, that's nice, thank you. Hello. Because if somebody's going to speak to me and give me direction, I want to make sure they've been in a desert because that means they've been in a solitary place and they've been in a place that can hear God. Yes. Great men of God, how God took them to solitary places. I mentioned Elisha. God put him in a solitary place so he could hear the Lord. When he's there at the riverbed and he's being fed by the raven and the water's there, he was in a solitary place. Are you listening to me? See, people are afraid to get quiet because they might hear God speak to them. And they might not like what God tells them. 
So they'd rather run around and hear from a lot of people that have no sense than to get quiet enough to hear the voice of God and not make their life a fool's playground. Hello. I tell people all the time, when my daughter had cancer years ago, I, I announced to the whole church, I said, I don't want any of you speaking to my daughter. Nobody. You speak to me before you speak to her. Hello? Because I didn't want any fools or idiots to tell my daughter something that would cause her spirit to be damaged or affected or influenced to negative thinking. How many of you hear that? Because my doctors had told us she was going to die that she, her cancer was so severe. I didn't want anything to disrupt the faith that I had that my daughter wasn't gonna die, she was gonna live. You understand that? And we need to be guarded by the fact that, that people roam around, that they wanna share their opinion. Listen, if they haven't got any sand in their shoes, stop listening to their opinion. God's true. You say, Pastor, how long you been doing this? 35 years. You want to know if you can hear from God? Well, I can tell you. I, I, I can tell you. I've been in the desert a couple times. I, I've been in there so many times that I got, I got sand in my shoes. I got sand in my hair. I got sand in my drawers. I got sand all over. I've been in this thing until I crawled around in the desert. But I guarantee you, where somebody's been, uh, they can take you to some place. But if they've never been where they want to take you, then where are they going to take you? Where they hope to go or where they've been? <laughs> 